Hi, Andrew. All right, so I guess we could start now. So if in case anyone missed it, um, this recording will be up on YouTube so you can review it on your own time. So start off, my name is Ken and I'll be presenting chapter two in the R for DS book, which is called Logical Vectors. So let me share my screen. Okay, let me, oops, oops, hold on one second. Let me close down a couple of, 
tabs. So, so I'll be presenting. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, Andrew. So, so I'll be sharing my screen. And so today we'll be presenting chapter twelve, logical vectors, in the Oxford Data data science book. So a little bit about this chapter is that we're going to be learning the following things. We're going to learn what are vectors and why are we talking about logical vectors, how to use logical vectors and Boolean algebra in comparison, identify missing values, what are the logic summary functions we could leverage in R, and what are the conditional transformations using if if else and case when functions. Okay. So in, so in this, so the thing about logical vectors is that before we go into more about logical vectors, we, we have to know what are logical vectors. So vectors in R work in the same way as for as arrays in the C programming language for anyone who's familiar with programming, which is a way in which you store multiple num pieces of information of the same type. And, and it's pretty much what we're going to be using to create logical vectors. And it's a way for you to you know, define certain constraints on your data to answer binary questions. So think like yes, no questions or is this true or is this not true? So those kind of questions, and that's where logical vectors come into play. For logical vectors, they are essentially take values true and false, which are represented as one and zero, respectively. And as a way to code in yes or no questions or true or false questions in general. And so before we get into such a logical vectors, we got to learn a little bit about how to use them in Boolean algebra. So, so as an example, I'm going to demonstrate using some code here. So, so as an example, let me submit a little bit. So let's say, for example, we have two vectors, x and y, where they both contain numbers. So x has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and y has four, five, six, seven, eight. And so the idea of sets is that you have a collection of values for each of these objects, so x and y. And there's certain, you can say, math operations you can perform with these sets, which are represented in way. So starting with this example, x and not y. What this basically means is, let's say you have two sets, x and y, and they intersect, right? And you want to find out all the numbers that are in X and are not in Y. This is what the exclamation mark means. It means negate, which means the opposite of Y, which in this case means anything that's not in Y. So what this statement basically means is give me all the numbers or pieces of information that's in the set X, but is not in Y, which the result is you get this thing right get this highlighted area right here, where let's say this thing on, on the left is X and this on the right on the, is Y. So essentially we're getting all the elements that are only in X. We're not getting the elements in the middle here because it's also in Y too, basically anything that it has in common. So a good example, going back to um, these two vectors right here, if I were to do get X and not Y, I can run this function set difference x and y. And if I run it, which will get you the difference between the two sets, what is it that they don't have in common with x? So basically running this set, set statement right here. So if you run it, you find out you get numbers 1, 2, and 3. And the reason for that is because you look up here x has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then y has 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it only includes 1, 2, 3, because 4 and 5 are not just in this vector x, but it's also in y. 
So you can see that it doesn't include four and five because it's already included in Y. And we're trying to get only elements that are just in X and not in Y. And four and five are both in X and Y. So that's what it, this means. Now, going back to this example, you have X. Essentially means all the elements that are in the set X, which, which includes the ones that are also in Y as well. So an example is if I run X, I get one, two, three, four, five, which are all the elements of X. Now, what if you want to get all the elements that are in either X or Y? That's what this straight line means. This ampersand here means and, but here this straight line, vertical line means or. So you want all the numbers that are in either X or Y. So if I go back here, I can do that by doing union, which is what this means, union. So the union of X and Y, which if you run this code, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which are all the elements that are in either X or Y. As we want, we essentially want elements that are in either X or Y, including the ones that are in both. And then here, you also have, what if you want elements that are in X and Y? Elements that are in both, not exclusive to X or Y. So a way to do that in R is you run this command intersect X and Y here, and you run it, you only get four and five because as I mentioned earlier, four or five are the only two numbers that are in X and Y. You can see here, X has four and five and Y has four and five. Those are the only two numbers that they share together. So that's why when you run intersect, you get four and five because those are the two numbers that they both share. So we, we, when you read the statement, you think of it as the intersection of X and Y. In other words, what numbers do they both have in common? Okay. And then you have X or X, Y, which essentially means give me all the numbers that are only in X or only in Y. They cannot be in both. So that's what this statement means, X or, X or Y, X, X or. So if you go back here, so it's essentially, if you break this down, it essentially means it's the same thing as X and not in Y or Y and not in X. So the way to run this would be to get the set difference between X and Y and then the set difference of Y and X and then get the union of it. Because whichever element you put in first, it's what it's gonna prioritize and include. So, if you run this, you get one, two, three, six, seven, eight. Because as I mentioned earlier, four and five are the only two numbers in X and Y that are in both sets together. So we're only getting the numbers that are unique to X or Y. As one, two, three is in X, six, seven, eight is in Y. Right? And then next up, you have not in X, but it's in Y. So essentially it's the reverse of, of this where we're getting all the elements that are in Y, but they're not in X, which means we don't get any elements that are in Y, but are also in X. So to run that, you just switch the order. So Y, X right here. And you get six, seven, eight, because as we said earlier, four and five are in X and also in Y too, they're in both. And we only want elements that are unique to Y. And then finally, you have Y, which is essentially all the elements in Y, which you can just type out the name of the vector, and it'll give you all the elements that are inside. All right. So this is just um, a little bit of review of Boolean algebra, so that way you understand how these, how these logical operators kind of work, especially, which is very important when you're doing comparisons or making logical statements or if else statements, which we're going to talk about more about as we get through this chapter. All right.
So now that we have a little bit of review about what Boolean algebra is, let's go into one of the biggest applications of logical vectors, which is to make numeric comparisons. So as a little case study, we're going to look at the NYC flights data set, which covers data on flights from New York in 2013 using the NYC flights 13 package. So we're going to go in and load the two libraries together. So you could use this command here. So just run this command here, here. And let's say as an example, since in previous um, chapters, you learned about these functions like mutate and filter, let's see if we can do some filtering where we get the department time that's greater than 600 and department time less than 2000. And we get the, the arrival time delay that's less than 20, 20 minutes. So, wait, one. So if you run this command, hold on. If you go down here, Okay, this takes a while, but you see here that it shows you all the flights that meet this condition, where the department time is greater than 600 minutes, from times less than 2,000 minutes, and then the, the, the arrival delay is less than 20 minutes. You have a list of all that. And the way this works is that it's essentially a bunch of logical statements where it checks that the department time is, is greater than 600 and also checks that it's less than two, department time is less than 2000. And it checks also that. So it's essentially one long chain of and statements here. Now, now the thing about this process is that it's doing a lot of things under the surface that it's hiding. So it's essentially making logical vectors to essentially check these statements and check if they're true or not before it does something like what filter is doing, deciding whether or not to include certain rows. Which um, might be a challenge if you want to check your work, especially check that you get the results that you want. But there's a way to do that, especially to check your, double check your work that the work that it's doing when it's evaluating these logical statements. And one of the ways to do that is to go into the mutate function and go into the mutate function, essentially create columns in the data set that contains the variables that you're looking at and also store the results of all these um, conditional statements that you're making that you want to get the results of. And then you set this argument.keep equals used. So I'll show you how it works in the R Studio. So 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 because you remember here we're checking that the department time is greater than 600 and then less than 2000. And you also have the arrival delay right here. So, so basically what we're doing is that when you run this statement, what it's going to do is that this column right here essentially checks every single row to make sure that these conditions are met. If these conditions are met, it will return true. And then it will turn false if these conditions are met. So if it finds a row where the department time is not greater than 600 or less than 2000 and less than 2000, then it will write it as false because it doesn't meet that condition. And the same thing applies here, where it checks this statement here and it will return true or false. So we're essentially checking the statement, but we're returning the result as a variable. And then this dot keep dot used basically means that that when we because whenever you run um, a command like this, where you're just filtering or modifying a, a data frame without setting to an object, it will return the modified data frame. And this dot keep 
equals used basically says that that we only want the columns that are used in the in this statement. So in this case, this used argument basically says that all the names of all these columns that are used, so date time, department time, departure time, approx on time, and arrival delay. Since these columns are mentioned here, those are the only columns that should appear in the outputted data frame. So all these other columns that we're seeing here, like year, month, and day, they're not included. So that's what this use means. We only want the columns that are used in this operation here. So if you're curious about how that works, there's um, a link in the Tidyverse website that can tell you more about how it works. So, so if you want to learn more in depth how it works and the different arguments you can pass into it, you can go to this link here, which if you open it, it will take you into a description of how mutate works and the different arguments that you can employ. So if you go down to dot keep, you can see how there's different arguments. Use essentially means that any columns that you use in the operations that you do in mutate, it will only show those columns that are used in that operation. And then all is basically the default argument. Basically, if you add new columns or not, just show all the columns, even the ones that you didn't use. And then it's unused and none. So, so this is just something in case you're curious about what, what what's it doing. Sure. Okay. Now, going back to the to the to the output, you can see here we have department time. So we have a question here and it's asking if I group variables first and then mutate, does it keep the group variables? That's, that's a good question. So, so well, for in that case, um, it will only, it doesn't consi consider the, the variables that are used in the group statement. It only considers the ones that are used here. So if there's no column mentioned in here, in this mutate or filter or whatever you use, then it will only keep these regardless of whether or not it's been grouped. So if you did group a variable and then use that same variable, mention that same variable here in mutate, it will keep it simply because it's mentioned here in this statement here. But, but if it's grouped here and it's not mentioned here, then it won't keep that column. So this use argument only applies to information, any any columns applies to this locally to this function that it's used in. So it wouldn't exactly keep it. It only, it only cares if you mention it here, wherever you're using this used argument here. So does that make sense? Yeah, so if you want it to use it to have that group variable be mentioned, you have to mention it wherever this use argument is used, right? All right, does that answer your question? Uh, hello, uh, yes, yes, it did. But it's also uh, very sad for me because usually uh, we will want to find problematic rules and we need to know like the ID column so we can tell that our collaborators which role has problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But maybe uh, yeah i think it's just good for like self checking maybe like like yeah i mean it's like little self checking from my end but if i want to present a report to tell my collaborators which rose got problem like for example when i use the logical vectors we have na's instead of true and false they want to filter them and we need to tell them which role is the problem? Uh, I'm not so sure whether I can use um, use the dot key because the use. <laughs> yeah. Um. So in that case, um, I guess what you can do is, I guess try to 
I guess that makes me curious though. Like what would happen if I, let's say I want to know the year. So what if I put year equals year? This is kind of redundant, but oh, okay. Yeah, oops. You need a comma. Oh, okay. So I guess a workaround is maybe you can type something like this. I might have to look that up, but yeah. So there's, I think there's a way to include some ID variable. Yeah, it's just that you have to mention it somewhere here. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, because this keep dot use argument essentially just only includes columns that you mention in this function here. So there's also some other arguments you can try too, like used, unused, or even all or none. So yeah, depending on your needs, um, you're, you're welcome to kind of try out different arguments. So we can sneak in the ID variable. So that way it doesn't get ignored when you run the statement. All right. All right. Okay, okay. Okay, so, all right, so moving on. Um, so, so yeah, so essentially when you run this statement, it essentially shows you only the columns that are used in this statement. And you can, this is a good way if you want to check your results, the results of this logical statement here. So you can see how it gives false because it's not daytime, approximate on time, all these different statements, which are hidden when it's when you don't use this dot keep, or which are hidden when you run the statement right here. So this is just a way for you to check your work if you want to see what it's doing. Yeah. All right. So moving forward. Um, another note to make is that it doesn't the thing about R is that it doesn't round float numeric values by default. So oftentimes when you see, say, numbers or decimals, it usually rounds it to the closest integer. And one of the ways to round it is to use the dplyr near function. So as a way to show you, so I'm, let's say I run this. And, and I open this thing. You can see here that it rounds it to the nearest integer. And I, I can show you if I asked it to print out the results here, but give 16 digits. So you get the 0 0.99999 and then 2.0004. Yeah, which is just a product of kind of the computations that R does. But most of the time, it's usually rounded nicely to one or two. And it's something that R has built in by default. So, so if you run dplyr near, let's say you do it. Oh, okay. So dplyr near, so let's say for example uh, with flights. Maybe you it's just taking two variables, the x a vector and not a number. So maybe like x square one and okay. Yeah. Let's say for example we want to do let's say department delay. So d plier near department delay. If you were to run, okay. Oh, okay. Department. Let's say you want to run department time. Okay. I'll have to check back on this, but feel free to play around with that. Uh, you know. uh, hi. Uh... Wait, do you have a question? No, I guess I was reading the manual. Yeah, actually, they have a way to compare it in the manual, in the actual book, actually. 
Yeah, maybe I'll just copy the code and put it in the chat. Oh, yeah, oh okay. I think yeah, I... In the, yeah. The, okay. It just... Yes. Yeah. So... Yeah. So essentially, near is essentially a function in dplyr that checks if two numbers are pretty much equal to each other or close to each other. So it's a function that you can use to especially check, though. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Thank you. So that's just another tool that you can have. You want to compare two numbers and see how close they are to each other. Yeah. All right. So next up, we have um, missing values. So one of the problems that you might run into is that when you have missing values, it might mess things up a little bit with logical vectors. And a lot of it's because missing values, it's sometimes depending on how it's used in the logical statement, it might, it, it might not give a result because depending on the logical statement, it's unclear if it's true or false. But depending on the logical statement, it may not even matter. So a, a good example would be, let's say true or true. True or true and false or true are both true. So NA or true must be true because as long as one, say in this example, NA or true, that will be true because with a union or an or statement, as long as one of them is true, it doesn't matter what the value this is. So we can ignore this NA and it will just still be true. If, however, you have NA and false, you, you, it will return NA because we don't know. In order for this AND statement to be true, we have both of them have to be. Actually, no, this will return false because as long as one of them is false, then it doesn't matter what this number is, what this is it will still be false. And I can sh kind of show you in the code too. So like an example, let's say you have false and missing as I show you, it's gonna be false because in order for this and statement to be true, everything has to be true. So you need at least one false for it to be false. If you have true or missing, it's true because it doesn't matter what the other number is as long as one thing is true. And then false or and A, you're going to get N A because you need to know what the other value is in order to know if it's true or not, for sure. And we can show you in the example. So you have a, a tibble with true, false, and N A. And then we're going to do some mutations where we're going to create a logical vector that evaluates each of these statements compared with each of these values in X. So if you run that, you get that true and NA gives you true and you have an NA you and NA you get NA because true needs the other element to be true in order to be true. But if it's or then it becomes true because it doesn't matter what that other value is. You know, only one of them needs to be true to be true. And the same kind of logic applies when you have um, false. S similar logic with, goes with false. So if you have false and NA, it becomes false because for some for an AND statement to be false, you only need one and one, at least one false. But if it's OR, then it becomes NA because you don't know what the other value is. NA could be true or false, but we don't know. So this is just an example of just how that would work when you're running logical statements with NAs or missing values. And, and sometimes NAs can be a bit of a, a challenge to deal with, but there's a way to find out what those missing values are, are. So one of the ways to go about that is to use is.na function, which works with any type of vector and it gives true if there's any missing values and false for everything else. So this statement here, let's break down what it's doing. So 
I go into our, our console and essentially, essentially if you run, if you run this, it will check if there's any missing values here in this vector of true and NA and false. So it gives false here because true is not a missing value. It gives true here. It give, I mean, it gives false because it is a value here. And it gives true here because NA is a missing value. That's what NAs are. And then for here, it gives false because false is an actual value. So that's just one way you can check by just running is.na on a vector. And these are just more examples of that where if you run this command here, it'll give false for these two numbers because they're actual numbers, they're not missing, and then true here. And the same also applies for even characters too. And if you wanna do more complicated um, conditional statements, you can run this command here. You can use this, this thing, percent in and then percent which is a way if you want to check if um, certain numbers are inside a sequence. So in this case, in this statement here, you want to know if this sequence from 1 to 12, do any of these numbers exist in this vector of 1, 5, and 11? So when you run this, you get true, false, 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 true, false, and all these different values. So essentially checking each of these numbers from one to 12 and checking if they exist in this vector here. So for the first one, it's true because number one exists in this sequence. Good question. So we have a question, does is.na work for like special terms like n-a-n? So, oh, okay, let me make that a vector, oops. So yes, yes, to answer your question, it does work because NAN, it's um, registered as a missing value. And then for, in, for inf, infinity, it stands for infinity, it's registered as false because Infinity is a special number. So it's treated as a number in R. It's not a missing value. As it has a special property, it's treated as a number. It's supposed to represent a very large number in R. So yes, it does work with this. So if you get null NAN or NA, it, they're registered as missing values. And then for any special numbers, like, like say, inf, which stands for infinity, then it's not treated as a missing number. Right. If that makes sense. Right. Going back. So essentially, so we kind of talked about this sequence. Um, now, let's go into the next section, which talks about with, where the thing about logical statements is that there are extra things that you can do to enhance your, you know, when you're writing logical statements. So some of the, these functions that you can use are any and all. With any meaning that you have a set of conditions, you only need one of them to be true for it to be true. If they're all of them are true, it's great, but only one of them, at least one of them needs to be true. So this is useful if you're writing a bunch of logical statements, one after the other, or have a bunch of conditions. And then all essentially is like the and percent where you have a bunch of conditions and they all have to be true to be true. So a good example is say, you have a, a vector right here, right? Let's say you have these numbers right here, two, five, four, eight, nine, four. And let's say we have the function any, and I'm gonna write a logical, um, I'm gonna write, um, Um, any where it's test vec greater than five because R is vectorized. Basically, what it's going to do is it's going to check every single number 
and see if any of them are greater than five. So if I run this, it's true because say number eight is greater than five. So the way any works is as long as one of these statements is true, then the whole thing becomes true. It's kind of like uh, with unions, you only need one, one of them to be true for the whole thing to be true. Now, if I were to run all instead, you're going to get false because yes, eight and nine are greater than five, but two, four, five, and this four here, they're not greater than five. So because there's at least one of them or more of them that don't meet this condition, the whole thing is false. So these are just extra tools that you can use if you're trying to make more complicated um, lo uh, logical statements. And there's also other functions that you can use too, like mean and sum as, as a way to work with logical vectors, especially if you want to get percentages just as, of just how of certain constraints or the condition. So for, you have a question. So how does any and all react when there are missing values? So when there are missing values, so it usually depends. It goes back to this example we had earlier with this false true right here, where it depends on the, the statement that's being made and also the conditions you have. So for any, as long as one of them is true, then it will be true. But if it cannot figure that out because one of them gives NA, then it will evaluate to NA. And then similarly with all, as you understand, if one of them is false, then the whole thing is false. So it doesn't matter the NA, but if it's not very clear, what NA is, then it will come back as, as NA. So it works kind of similarly to up here, right here, just with same as with just that we were doing it with any and all. So I guess a good ex demonstration would be if, let's say I throw in an NA here. Let's say I throw in a couple of NAs and I try running this. So here it's still true because the way any works is like union. As long as one of these conditions are met, then it doesn't matter what these NAs are. You just need one of them to be met. But if I and if I run this, it'll still be false because at least one of them fails this condition, so it becomes false. So it works the same way that we did earlier when we were talking about false and missing and true and missing. So does that make sense? Yeah. So any and all are just convenient ways of just doing unions and intersections. I mean, you could still do these long chains of ands and unions, but any and all is might be preferable if you want something more compact to hold all these logical statements. Now, going back to the R console. Let's show how you can use mean and sum to work with logical statements. So as a case study, let's say you have a, a vector of true, true, false, and true, and you run this. And let's say I want to know if I have at least three trues. So because you have to remember that true is represented as the number one, false is represented as number zero. So you can actually do math with these with true and false. And that can be useful in many ways. Like for example, if you want to find out if I have at least three trues, what I can do is use sum to add up all the true values and then check if it's greater than two. And see here, it's true because true is represented as one and we have three true. So one plus one is two plus one here gives us three. And three is greater than two, so that's true. And then you have the mean, which is useful if you want to get a percentage of 
elements in this logical vector that are true. Because the way mean works is basically you add up all the numbers and you divide it by the number of numbers. So if I run to run mean on test vec one, I get 0 0.75, which the way it works is you have four elements here and you add up all, you do, you take a sum of all of them. So true is one. So one plus one and then false is zero. So one plus one plus zero, that's just two plus one is three. And then we have four numbers. So three divided by four gives you 0 0.75, which can also be interpreted to mean that 75% of our data are, are true values. So it's a pretty neat feature and it's useful, especially when you're working with logical vectors. If you wanna get a percentage of them that are um, true and some is useful if you wanna get an account of how many of them are true. Pretty, pretty neat stuff and might be useful when you're working with more complicated, more larger logical vectors. Okay. All right, so next up. Can, so another thing that you can do with logical vectors is that you can do conditional transformations using if, else, and case when functions. And it's very similar to how SQL does it with conditional transformations especially if you want the values of a vector to change depending on whether it meets a condition or not. And we can use the if else from dplyr to do this, especially when you just have one condition and you wanna map it to a bunch of different outcomes. So as an example, I'm gonna to go to RStudio and let's say you have a vector right here of numbers from negative three to three. So negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. And then you have NA here. And in this if else from dplyr, or which you can also call by specifically by doing dplyr and then two colons and if else to set this up, let's say you wanna make a vector where you want to um, get a set of vectors where the value changes depending on the condition. So we have this vector X and you wanna check if each of them is greater than zero, right? And so what these three arguments are, I'm, I'm gonna show you, explain to you. So this first argument after this condition, basically is where you put what you want the value to be if the condition is met. So if X is greater than zero, what is the value of this, this element? And then the second one right here is what number, what value to put if the conditions fail. So if X is not greater than zero, what, no, what value do we put? And then this question mark right here is basically, is an optional argument that you can put where you can tell R what to put when you have missing values. So any missing values that it finds, it will put it as these three question marks. So if you run this, you get, Negative V, V, E, negative V, E, negative V, E, negative V, positive V, E, positive V, positive V, and then question mark. Because negative three to negative two, negative one, and zero are not greater than zero. And then one, two, three are greater than zero. So it's positive V, E because the condition is met. And then the question mark is because we have this N, A at the end. So... So this is useful if you want to create a vector where the value changes depending on whether or not a condition is met. Now, what if you have a bunch of different conditions and you want to specify what happens when certain conditions are met? Let's say you don't have one condition, you have multiple conditions that will affect the value. So you want, say you want more control over it. And one of the options you can use is case when which allows you to specify all these different cases. So we still have this example where X is these numbers from negative three to three, and then you have NA. And so in case when the way it works is for each line you, with a comma, you specify the condition. So X is equal to zero. And then you put the tilde sign, and then you put the value that you want it to be to, to, if this condition is met. And and then you can keep stacking all these conditions 
there. And then you also have is.na where you can just put that as these question marks. So this is useful if you have multiple different conditions that you want to set as opposed to just one up here. So you run this, you get different conditions where you get the same results as up here, but now we have this special case for when x is equal to zero. As you can see here, when we've got that, we're trying to, when we got to the number zero and we're meeting this condition and it failed, we end up giving it negative VE. Here we specify what we want zero to be when we evaluate it. So you get the same thing as above, but we have a special case for when X is equal to zero. So that is useful if you want more control on the conditions and you have multiple conditions that you want to evaluate. So that's just an extra tool that you can use if you want more control over conditions or you have multiple different outcomes for the logical statements. And as a side note, when you're doing if else statements, make sure that these comparisons are valid, that the whatever you're comparing, the two objects you're trying to compare, that they both are the same type. So this statement would only be will only work if X is a number that you can compare to. In this case, yes, it is because these are all numbers and they can be compared to a number. So if you try comparing a string or a character to a number, you'll get an error because they're not the same type. So when you're doing if else or case when, make sure that the two things that you're trying to compare are the same type. So numbers with numbers, characters with characters. So that's just a, a little side note when you're doing these kind of comparisons. Um, I think the same type is supposed to be, oh, the logical outputs, right? Like, go back, <clears throat> go back to twelve point four. I think it's trying to say like when we after we did the comparison, it has either to be all strings or all numeric or all logical. Like, we can't have like x equals to zero and then you put a numeric zero instead. Like, like what do you mean? Like, put a zero. No, I mean the second zero. Right here? No, like, I mean the still the first row. Right but here? after the tiddle. Yeah, it can be this one as well. Uh, it is better to say, like, if it's true, it must be a, a string output. If it's false, it must also be a string output. If it's missing, it must also be a string output. Oh, these are string outputs. Yeah, so it's trying to say that you cannot have one that is a string output, another one is an integer output, another one is a Boolean output. So, so I guess I was trying to say is that when you're doing these comparisons here, these two things have to be the same type. Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm trying to follow along, but I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Uh, no, I'm saying that the when after the condition is checked, you yeah. need to give some values, right? Yeah. Yeah, so these values must be of the same type as well. Oh, these values? Yeah, they have to be the same type as well. You can't have one that is numeric. The second condition when it's wrong is a string, and when it's missing, it's something else. So oh, you, okay. That's what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, because we always make this mistake. Mm -hmm. When like when x equals to zero, I put the numeric zero instead of a string. And then it always gives an error. And I usually I do not know why it is an error because <laughs> the error oh. message may not be so obvious. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Like when you're yeah. when you that in in a vector, all the elements have to be the same type. Yeah. Yeah, it's an easy error. Yeah, yeah so like, like when your first case, like you would send the zero from character to a numeric as the output condition. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I could throw an error if I'm not mistaken. Not yeah. sure. Definitely. Yeah, it's why... Um, like when you're making vectors, you have to check that they're the same type and that with zero, do you mean 
zero as a string or as a thing. Like I, I put it uh, as, as a, a string to be the same as yeah, zero. yeah. But if you put it as a without the quotes, right? You can try it. I think mm -hmm. it will throw some errors. Just put zero. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But yeah, yeah. But you see this very strange error that takes some time to find out what it is. Right. You can't combine two different types. Yeah. Yeah, and things get pretty ugly when you have a default function. Like mm -hmm. there's actually a case where it has a default. Like if it doesn't if your four conditions don't match, it gives a default. Yeah. And sometimes we put the default as a string instead of a numeric. And then our four first four conditions for all numeric like integers. And then they also throw this error because the default is also it's actually a string if your conditions are if a vector is actually a string and you want to turn them to integers by comparison of case when. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a very easy error to, to make sure, definitely. Yeah, like I'll admit I've done that a couple of times myself. Yeah. All right. And so, so moving on, um, so for the summary, um, so essentially logical vectors are just a bunch of Boolean elements. So it's a lot of true and false, um, which are represented as ones and zeros in code. And R has a lot of tools to evaluate them based on Boolean algebra, based what which is what we showed earlier in 12.2. And it's a pretty useful way to summarize data based on certain conditions. And we also talked about conditional transformation and how it's useful in data analysis and also getting yes or no questions about your data. So it's a pretty, pretty neat tool and it's a pretty good way to do it quickly. So with that, that's the end of chapter 12. I wanna say thank you all for coming. Um, next week um, we have, <clears throat> so Jeremy, who's gonna be presenting chapter 13. So I hope you all um, look forward to that and I'll see you all next week. So thank you for coming and have a great rest of your day.